Hello, my name is Ken Kramer and I'm inter uh, an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And today I'm interviewing L uh, Russell Lee Smith. This is December the 4th, 2006 at the Madera Library. Our camera operator, operator today is Robin Warner. Welcome and thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you, I appreciate being invited to participate. It's great to hear the stories of, uh, of the World War II veterans, and I'm anxious to hear yours. So maybe you could start by just talking a little bit about what you were doing before you entered service and how you came up, made the decision to okay. enter. Well, uh, actually I was in high school when Pearl Harbor, uh, a friend of mine that lived across the street and I had gone to a movie uh, this, this Sunday afternoon. December the 7th, 1941. Wow. I was a senior in high school at the time. We came out of the movie in the afternoon and at like 4.30 or 5 o'clock. He had an old Plymouth automobile and I used to joke about that he had automatic gear shift before there was such a thing because the gears were so worn that all he had to do, he didn't even have to use the clutch, he just he could shift them around. If the engine speed was right, he could shift it. But anyway, we got into the car, turned the radio on, and we heard the news about Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Well, I continued then, finished high school in June of 42, and I knew, since the U.S. was in World War II then, that I would be drafted. Uh, I was only 17 at the time. <clears throat> I wasn't going to be 18 until September, but I knew that when I became 18, I'd be drafted. So they they offered people to a choice of the branch of service if they volunteered for induction, which I thought, well, that sounded pretty good to me. So I volunteered or I signed up to go into the Army Air Corps, and uh, they accepted me and. Uh, I was called up in January of 1943, sent to St. Petersburg, Florida for six weeks of basic training. And while there, uh, they gave us some tests to determine our aptitudes and what we might be qualified for. And they told me that I could pick really whatever specialty I wanted based on the test scores. So I picked the School of Photography at Denver, Colorado, Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> and uh, I, had, after basic training, I went out to Denver, arrived in Lowry Field on April the 1st, 1943, and started photography school. And about two weeks or three weeks into photography school, I found out that they had an aerial mapping program. And I thought, well, that sounds better than just photography. So I applied for that and had to take an examination, which was nothing more than the mathematics. And they said, well, you can start in the next class of the what they call the photogrammetry school or photo topography. Photo topography. And uh, <clears throat> so I did. And uh, part way through that program. My mother's sister, my Aunt Evelyn, died, and I asked if I could go home to the funeral. And they said, yes, but you'll have to shift back to the next class because I would miss enough time in the mm -hmm. class that uh, I wouldn't qualify for graduating with that class. And I said, well, that's okay. So anyway, I did that, came back, and finished up the photo mapping school in August of 1943. And we were sent, the class was sent down to Peterson Field in Colorado Springs. There they formed a unit which consisted of 31 enlisted men and two officers that became a photo mapping unit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we had a couple of weeks of overseas training there. Then we went to Salt Lake City at Kearns uh, Field or in, outside of Salt Lake City 
for 10 more weeks of overseas training. From but there... Overseas training, what do you mean by that? Well, it was just, you know, <laughs> I, I can't remember too much about it anymore, but when I think about it, it was, uh, it was mostly just adjusting to being overseas and... and how, how to adjust and yeah, what to Yeah, how expect. to adjust to, to okay. the conditions of living in a military life uh, without much amenities and so forth, that kind of thing. Okay. And anyway, then we got on a train and went all across the country to Virginia for shipment overseas. Uh, and <clears throat> there were, <clears throat> as I, excuse me, as I said before, there were 31 enlisted men and two officers in we called our unit the 31 Club. That was the, the nickname that we gave ourselves. Uh, we left, we went to St. Pat, uh, Camp Patrick Henry in Virginia for a couple of days and then got on a, a ship. It was a British cruise ship that had been converted to uh, carry, troop carriers. So the we 31 went, Club would be would be assigned as a group somewhere. Yeah, we were well, we were already assigned, but we didn't exactly know okay. where and what. So we left Patrick Henry, mm -hmm. and this ship was a faster ship than the typical troop carrier. So uh, we went unescorted, no, no uh, submarine or no escorts of any kind, no destroyers or whatever just out there all by herself, and we went across the Atlantic to Casablanca in North Africa. And we didn't have any excitement. I mean, it was a, just a five-day trip across the ocean. We went into Casablanca and spent a couple of days or a week, I don't know, remember how much anymore, in a little camp there, and then we took a train across North Africa to Bizerti, which was on the Mediterranean shore. Uh, that's up in near Morocco, uh, where Morocco is today. And the car, the train, what we rode in were boxcars. Back in the World War I days, they had the 40 and 8s, which were 40 men and 8 horses. And our boxcars were like, we slept on the, on the floor, you know. And uh, we slept in tents when we were over there. And when we were in tents, we were on the ground. I mean, it was uh, no beds or no bunks or anything. It was just right on the ground. And uh, we finally, about the first of, this is, this is now November of 42 through December, um, we finally went back to, to Oran from Baserti. In other words, you backtracked. And by the way, that, that that was a period of time when the battle, the fighting in North Africa was finished, winding down, and the uh, Allied troops were getting ready to go into Italy and on up through Europe. So there wasn't much, you, all we saw in the way of wartime activities was a few prisoner of war camps, really. We didn't have any fighting or any, uh, we weren't in, in harm's way, as they would say today. But we went back to Oran, got on another ship, British ship, and went through the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, the Red Sea, over to Bombay. And from Bombay, we got on another train, a bunch of boxcars, went across India to Calcutta. And from Calcutta, we got on to, uh, into uh, regular military trucks and were convoyed up to Ishapur, which is where the 9th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron was based. And that's where we were, that was our destination. <clears throat> the, 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 the things that we did, but the first, the first summer that we were there in, the, in Ishapur then with the 9th Photo Company, reconnaissance squadron. We did have bunks, but we slept in tents. And it's a good thing we had the bunks. They, they were nothing more than just wooden frames with a, uh, a, a rope type net to mm -hmm. hold the sleeping bag <laughs> that you had. And, uh, but when the monsoons came down, our whole tent area was underwater. So it, it was terrible. I mean, you couldn't put anything on the ground. It got moldy and 
mildew. That's and, where the water bed gets done. Yeah, it was that it was that low. But anyway, uh, the second summer we were there. By that time, we had regular mm. yeah. barracks. Barracks, you know, yeah. which they're nothing fancy, <clears throat> but they were they were buildings, and then we had bunks over there. And that was on higher ground, and we had no problem with with the water. But uh, our, our main job was to make maps for the the infantry that. The fighters that were in Burma primarily, General Joe Stilwell and Colonel Merrill. And uh, we also made a map for the engineer corps that used to replace, to build the Burma Road, which is a replacement for the, the old Burma, the Lido Road, rather, I should say, which was a replacement for the old Burma Road, which had been bombed out by the Japanese. Can you describe the process of how, what, how you made a map or what? Well, first of all, the, the pilots took photographs. We had aerial cameras in the planes. Uh, where the armament or the guns normally would be, they took those out and put in these cameras. So the planes, the pilots were up there flying planes with no, no armaments. They couldn't defend themselves from that standpoint. But were they, they took these photographs. Were they being fired upon? Oh, yeah. We had several of them that we, we lost the planes. Really got hit and they crashed and so forth. But anyway, they would take the photographs uh, looking down on the ground. And which planes did they use? P 38s. P 38s. The, the, uh, the fighter craft was called a P 38. When they took the guns out and put cameras in, they called them F 4Us or F 5. Uh, but they were, it was a Lockheed mm -hmm. uh, twin fuselage, oh. twin engine plane. Uh, <clears throat> very nice plane, but it was a single person, only one person flew in the plane. Uh, they would bring the film back of the pictures that they had taken, and we would process it, and then we would have to make prints from the negatives, but we would have to, I use the term tip and tilt, the, the negative to get it to print as if it was taken perfectly vertical with the ground. So you had to compensate. We had to compensate. For, when, for the angle yeah, of the plane. Yeah, at, that's right. When the, when, the fire, when the picture was taken, we didn't know what angle and stuff. We had to compensate for that. We had a way of, of calculating that. Uh, but the, one of the things that, was, that gave us a little bit of a problem, when we arrived in India, our equipment didn't come with us. We had our, our our, what we called restitutional printers that we used for for printing at these different angles. And a fellow who was worked for, his name was Gordon Smock. He was from Indianapolis. And he had been a draftsman for uh, Allison Engine Company in Indianapolis before he got in the service. And I had done some drafting when I first got out of high school. I went to work for the Brad, uh, Bradford Machine Tool Company in, in the west end of Cincinnati in just a couple of few months. So he and I actually designed and built our own printers. And that was a, it, there's a picture of it in the book that I uh, brought for the, for the project. Uh, and that was very interesting to, to get involved. Were these with printers like uh, photo enlargers? It was, yeah, it was like an uh, a, uh, an enlarging mm -hmm. uh, camera. Of big, I would imagine. They, there's a picture of they're pretty big. This was <clears throat> it's in the back end of that uh, book. You put together a very comprehensive book uh, of uh, pictures and uh, captions and. Uh, Anybody, this, this is a wonderful thing to have leave to your family and to yeah. help illustrate. The, so if anybody gets a chance to look at this, it's real worth the time. I really did that originally for my children, so they would have some kind of a record of what I did. And I thought since this project came up, I'd just make a copy of it Excellent. and give yes. it to you. So you, uh, since the prescribed enlargers, printers didn't, weren't uh, available, you built your own. Yeah, and the, and built the, your the own. actual lens 
I think we went out and stole that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we, we commandeered it or whatever they, the term they used, you know. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have anything. Uh, none of the equipment that we would normally use came. And uh, everything, we would have maps and we would have latitude and longitude identification to various points. And then we would use those and using an erector set, kind of, that's what I called it anyway. They were just long strips of metal and we would form them together like a, a mesh. And you could expand it or shrink it, contract it, whatever you had to do to get everything in between these identified points to the right scale. And then you, then you make the prints we, had, we could calculate what that was, then make the prints to fit that. Mm. And then we'd end up with a mosaic, a, what they call a, a photo map. Not, not a regular drawn map, but a photo map. Consisting of a number of pictures oh, but yeah. put together. Yeah, they, we, we did it on the floor. We had a, a fairly large room in our photo lab over there, and we would just make these templates and spread them out on the floor, and that's where we made the maps, right on the floor. Oh wow! It was ingenuity. It was really interesting work. Fabulous. <coughs> and then these maps were used by again the infantry, and by the infantry, the engineer corps for building the projects that they were working on. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Did you? You said your unit itself didn't come in harm's way, but some of the uh, planes or the uh, that were connected with your unit, or were they yeah. fired upon? And if you go to uh, <clears throat> the 9th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron's website, you can see pictures of some of the uh, planes that were, they took somebody, not, not our, our little unit, but somebody in the squadron uh, had access to taking pictures of these crash sites where some of our planes came down or were shot down, whatever happened to them. Would word get back to you that planes have been lost? Yeah. yeah. And uh, did you know the, the pilots? Or? I didn't know. That, that's, that is kind of a sad thing for me because uh, we had, our unit had a, a, a reunion in 2002 up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And <clears throat> that's when this, this uh, Ninth Photo Reconnaissance website first became known to us. And so when you go on there and you see all these names of the pilots and so forth, the people, they're, they're unknown to me. Uh, our little group of map makers must have been very con self-contained or whatever. Almost isolated. Yeah, isolated in a way uh -huh. because uh, <clears throat> when I see these pictures of the mechanics on the, that worked on the planes and the pilots and so forth, I, I recall almost none of those, those people, their names or the faces. And that saddens you? Yeah, that, that, we were, that we were not more involved with the total squadron. <clears throat> so you, your unit of basically 31 the 31 Club uh, pretty well stayed to yourself, I guess. I guess we did. We must have. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, how did you, uh, what are some of the ways in which you passed the time, uh, leisure time? For well, we, we ultimately had our uh, recreational room. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, I don't know who built it for us, but uh, it was there. Uh, I learned to play bridge. I never played bridge before. Uh, we were, the 9th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron was assigned to part of the 10th Air Force, and the air base that we were assigned to was actually a British air base, and the British air base had their own golf course adjacent to this airfield, and I learned I played golf, and I remember uh, you paid a rupee, for the caddy and a rupee for what they call the ball walla. And the ball walla would go out ahead of you. 
and you would actually hit to him. And his job was to keep your ball from getting lost out there. So now if you slice it way over to the side or something, he might have a hard time. But a rupee at that time was worth about 18 cents. And if we play a whole round of golf for, what, 36, 36 cents, you know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You, you were also saying that you guys formed a band? Yeah, we had a little uh, uh, band. Uh, we just played for the entertainment of our squadron. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, there were some other people from outside our squadron that were other, I don't remember what units they were, but they were, they, if they were musically inclined, they joined us. But we called ourselves the Melodiers. We even made up little, uh, what I called music stands for each individual to put the music on. And I remember <clears throat> writing home to uh, my girlfriend at the time from high school and asked her to send us, uh, what, what would you call that? Uh, uh, well, music anyway. Sheet uh, music? Sheet music, but when they break it down into, oh, yeah. for the saxophones and the yeah. trumpets and the trombones and so forth, uh, I forget the term they use, they use for that. The arrangements? The arrangements, that's it. For arranging, arrangements for music. Mm -hmm. If she could find some of that and she sent it to us. And so that's what, we got music any way we could. But we had a lot of fun. We did. And uh, you played? I played saxophone. But tenor sax. You were a clarinetist out of well, high school. When I was in grade school and through high school, all I ever played was a clarinet. And that's all I ever had or mm -hmm. ever owned was a clarinet. But when we got over to India, the saxophone was there, and I just picked it up and started to play it. But I'm not very musically inclined, so. <laughs> and you were also telling me about a, a board of cartoons that... Uh... Yeah, we had one fellow in uh, Val Reddick. He was from Pittsburgh area and he was sort of a cartoonist and he would put together these cartoons uh, and depict things about individuals and the one he put together for me uh, there was a fella in our unit called his name was john simmons he he's from oklahoma he now <coughs> lives in washington uh, with his uh, daughter state of washington with his daughter john was like a father figure to me he was Ten years older than I was, and uh, we used to. Well, he, we just. I, I just looked upon him as a, as a, as a, ga a guide. Mm -hmm. And so I, anyway, uh, Val put this cartoon together, and it shows me. Say, gosh darn, John or Simmons. I guess I called him Simmons. I said, I've been shaving for two years and I haven't cut myself either time. <laughs> that, was, that was his cartoon about me. You know, at uh, that time I didn't have much of a beard at all. <clears throat> so it prompts me to ask about morale. Uh, yeah. Was morale pretty good in your unit or? I think it was. Uh, I don't remember <clears throat> ever having, a, uh, you know, being really down in the... <coughs> Excuse me, down in the dumps and, and so forth. Uh, we we all I think we all knew we had a pretty good life compared to what it could have been for you know what other people went through. Our commanding officer was a uh, lieutenant. His, we had two officers, uh, Lieutenant Jack Chelius. He was from Chicago, and and Lieutenant Dudley St. John from California, and. Uh, Jack Chilius would tell us, look, I don't really care what you do as long as you get your maps made on time. So we pretty much could do what we wanted to do. We set our own schedule, uh, how many hours we would work during the day and so forth. Uh, so we, we, uh, we were pretty, we had it pretty nice in that respect and where we were out of any, I think in the time that we were there, we had two um, air, uh, air war aircraft warnings or alerts of Japanese coming, approaching with their aircraft. But other than that, we had, we were, we were nothing. <clears throat> uh, we had a softball team, 
and uh, I started out catching. Uh, and we had a fellow by the name, his last name was Axelrod. And he was a pitcher. And I don't know what happened to him, but this was a fast pitch league. And we played teams, uh, other military teams in the area, some British, some English, or some of U.S. And uh, he was, in, uh, for some reason or other, I decided that, well, he, if he's a fast pitch pitcher, I could be a fast pitch pitcher fast pitch pitcher and I don't know what happened to him whether he was moved somewhere else but I ultimately became all I know is I ultimately became the pitcher and when I wasn't pitching I was either catching or playing in the outfield in fact I broke my ankle <laughs> one time coming in for a low line drive uh, just beyond second base and, and uh, stepped in a hole I guess thing but anyway uh, but, you know, living conditions, we had our water, all of our water had to be treated because it was, there wasn't any, what I call purified water there. <clears throat> and the living conditions, especially with the, the local Indians, Indian people, was pretty bad. Uh, there's some pictures in that booklet I put together couple of the Gurkha guards that we had that were assigned to guard our base in our area. But yeah, we, that's, I don't know, we, there, there was a rest camp that the uh, military had set up up in Raniket, which was up in the Kashmir area of uh, northern India. And uh, we could go up there. I was up there once. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Did you keep? Uh, were you able to keep up with the news of the war? How it was going over? Pretty much. Yeah, I think we did. By radio or uh, newspaper or? Well, the uh, <clears throat> I guess it was mostly by newspaper because the the military, the Tenth Air Force, which was over, was that was in, in the Calcutta area of India. <clears throat> they had a a little newspaper that they put out and um, it contained pictures and, and stories and things of that nature and um, I think we pretty well knew what was going on. And with regard to the possible invasion of Japan, where, would you have been involved in that? Uh, had that occurred? Or uh, I don't been, uh, know. I don't know because, <clears throat> but in August of 1943, uh, I was, I and I think it was five other fellows were pulled out of our group and were actually on our way to China hmm. to establish a new mapping unit in China. And it was on, while on that route, on that uh, trip, journey, whatever you want to call it, that's when the Jap Japanese surrendered. And so I never made it to China. Uh, our, our travels were halted right then. And we stayed in a, you know, like a holding area for, I don't know, several weeks, I guess. And it was while in that holding area that I got a telegram from the Red Cross and ultimately a letter from my dad telling me that my mother had died. Oh, wow. And I had no I had no idea that she was ill in any way at all. She just she had a heart attack and died. And uh, by the time I heard about it, it was like 2 weeks after the the her death and after the funeral. So I never got to you know to see her at all. But uh, after being in that holding area for a couple of weeks, we finally worked our way back to Calcutta, got on a ship, and came back through the Mediterranean, back to New York. And it was, I always thought it was kind of interesting when I was pulled out of the 9th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron to go to China, the 9th was scheduled to be brought back to the States. Hmm. 
Well, as it turned out, with the war ending and everything, I ended up getting back to the States before they did. <laughs> and uh, I came back uh, through uh, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, past the Statue of Liberty, which was a, a nice thing to see. But, but that it, was pretty emotional. Yeah, it time. was. It really was. Uh, into Camp Kilmer and on to Indiantown Gap in Pennsylvania near Harrisburg for a discharge. It was while I was in Indiantown Gap that I met this one GI who was through the Battle of the Bulge in, in Europe and so forth. And when he found out I was from the CBI theater, he, oh my gosh, he said, I'm glad I was where I was. <laughs> I thought to myself, you didn't know <laughs> what I, what a, you know. What a, even compared to what he went through. Well, yeah. And I have a brother-in-law who has been through the Battle of the Bulge. And yeah. He, some of the things that he's told me, it, 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 unbelievable. But anyway, <clears throat> we did. I was very fortunate in, in my time. And then when I came back after the war, I got back. I remember the date was November the 5th. I arrived in Cincinnati after discharge 1945. The very next day, I went to University of Cincinnati to ask about enrolling in their engineering school. Ooh. And uh, they said, well, we're, you'll, we're gonna have to see a transcript of your grades from high school first. So I got on a trolley car, immediately from, from UC, I went right out to Western Hills High School and went to the office, got a copy of my transcript, I don't know how they would have it all that handy, but that's the way it worked out. And went right back to the University of Cincinnati, did it all in the same day. And uh, they, they let me know that, yes, you can do it. So I started right after New, New Year's Day in 1946, started the co-op program at the University did, of Cincinnati. Did you graduate as yeah. an engineer? Yeah. And then that was your career then? Yeah. Where did you work? Uh, well, I started working for Westinghouse. Uh, <clears throat> well, let me go back because being a, a co-op student at the University of Cincinnati, you had a job. You worked part-time and you went to school part-time, you know, alternated. And the first job, the company they sent me to was the Randall Company that made automotive parts and things for the automotive industry. So I went into the personnel office, and there's this young lady by the name of Mitzi Ostalov, the personnel secretary. And Carl Custer was the personnel manager. And so I told Mitzi, I told her what I was there, why I was there, and she went in and talked to Carl Custer, and Carl said, well, why don't you interview him first, and if you like him, and I'll talk to him. Well, is that Mitzi's ultimately became Mrs. Russell Smith. <laughs> so you must have really impressed her. So I guess I did. Uh, so. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, I worked with the Randall Company, and I wanted to. I worked in the engineering department as a draftsman and somewhat of a designer, and uh, I wanted to get out into the shop and get some hands-on shop experience. And they said, Well, no. We, we don't, we can't do that here. So I went back to the University of Cincinnati, back to the coordination department, they called it there. And I said, you know, I want to get some shop experience. So they arranged for me to go to the Staples Tool Company, which was down in the Camp Washington area. And there I worked on lathes and grinding, grinders and so forth. And I was there about a year and they, decided that they were not going to participate in the co-op program anymore. <clears throat> so on my own, I went back to the Randall Company and asked if I could come back. And believe it or not, they said, yeah, you can go work in the shop. <laughs> I, I, never, I could never under figure out things like that. But anyway, I finished up working in the shop there. When I graduated from UC, I went with Westinghouse. And we, I went to Pittsburgh to their which was their headquarters at that time, and they had a what they called the Graduate Engineering Training Program, and I was on that. <clears throat> and I had assignments at the Gearing Division, which was in East Pittsburgh, and the 
uh, steam, what they called the steam turbine division, which was in South Philadelphia, where they made turbine mm -hmm. generators, and then Lima, Ohio, which was a small motor division. And after the assignment at Lima, they decided that they'd like to have me stay there, uh, become a permanent member of their uh, manufacturing engineering department. So I guess you'd say I, that's, that's where I ended up. <clears throat> and uh, our first two children were born in Lima. Then I decided I didn't like Westinghouse because it, it seemed that me, every, everybody I knew that was going anywhere in the way of promotions was moving around. They, they weren't just growing, going up in the small motor division, they were moving to East Pittsburgh or wherever it was. And I didn't like that. I wanted to kind of settle down a little bit, so I decided to go back to Cincinnati. And I came back here and uh, went to work through my father-in-law's efforts. I got a job with the Taylor Wharton Iron and Steel Company. And that lasted one year. And things were looking like they wanted me to go to Eastern Pennsylvania. And that was just, I'm not, I don't want to move. So I left and went with the Gardner Board and Carton Company, which was a folding carton paper uh, board not company in Middletown, Ohio. But they had this big mill over here in Lachlan, Ohio, <clears throat> and a carton plant in Lachlan. And I was with them for, oh, almost, I guess, six years. And sure enough, <clears throat> there was a re kind of a reorganization within the company. <clears throat> and this new f fellow came in as a new president, and he was shaking things around. And I was asked to go to Connecticut to the corporate engineering as an engineering manager out there. And I decided, well, you know, I'll do it. And so I was out there for about two years, and then I was asked to come back to Middletown again. So we came back, and anyway, I finally left and, and came back to Cincinnati with the Mead Corporation, but still in the paper you know, industry. And I was with them for about 13 years, and uh, I could see or I could tell from the way things were going, their headquarters was in Dayton, Ohio. And from the way that the top management was making decisions, I, could I had a feeling that they were not interested in the corrugated division, which I was in, for the real long haul. And I had this fellow who owned a machinery company out in Baltimore, Bill Ward was his name, Ward Machinery Company. And he, for about five years, he had been, every time he would see me, he said, Russ, if you ever decide to leave me before you make a decision, come talk to me. He said, I'd like to have you join Ward. And so when it got to the point where I thought, well, you know, I think I am going to have to make a move, I gave him a call. And these had my Missy and I come out and spend a weekend out there. I liked what I saw and what I heard and so forth. So I told me I was leaving and I went out there and I spent 14 years out there. And uh, that, that I was senior product manager. And in that funk, in that position, all I could say is the world was open to me because we sold equipment every, worldwide, all over the world. And as senior product manager, I would follow up on all these installations with the customer and ended up doing training to show the people how to run the machinery better and uh, all that type of thing. And I was also, in Bill Ward's own words, I was the customer to our own engineering department. In other words, I represented the customer yeah. to the engineering department. But anyway, I, as a result, I literally traveled the world. I, you know, I got, I, I, I've never kept track of it, but I, I guess I've been to Australia 25 times, you know, on business of that type. But anyway. Sounds like a neat job. When I, it was. It was a fun job. It really was. 
And when I became 65, I said, well, I've had enough of this, I'm going to retire. But I didn't retire, I started my own consulting business, <laughs> doing the same thing, really, that I was doing with Ward, and that lasted until the beginning of this year. And so that was like 16 years of doing that on my own. So are you really truly retired? I'm retired now, yes. I, in fact, I, I, uh, I, I just can't travel like I used to. Sure. I have a, I have a balance problem now, yeah. which I'm still trying to figure out what's causing it. And the doctors don't seem to know, but uh, I could not do what I did a year ago. Yeah. You know. Well, this has been very. Don't, don't ask me to walk a straight line. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You'd think I was a drunken <laughs> sailor. <laughs> No sobriety test. Yeah. <clears throat> this has been very, very interesting, and I certainly want to thank you for being willing to come and tell well, your story. And I also want to thank you for the service that uh, you gave to your country. It's, it's helped, I think, make us a safer place. Well, so I appreciate it, and I thank you for inviting me. And uh, I hope it, it, it kind of helps. You know, I read a book uh, by Tom Brokaw called The Greatest Generation. Mm -hmm. Have you read that? Yes. That was a great book, I thought. Yes. Yes. And uh, I th at the time he wrote that, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's not enough of what people in the military do for this country that is known by the average citizen. And uh, I have an awful lot of respect for all the military, the people who are in mm -hmm. Iraq or wherever they are. Uh, because they they give up an awful lot. Sure. And, uh, and it's important that that's known and it's right. the yeah. purpose of this project yeah. and you have helped enlighten yeah. us even more. Right. So well, thanks again. I thank you very much. Appreciate it.